Investigating the paleo history of whales is a favorite topic in evolutionary studies because it's such a dramatic change. A complete suite of body-wide adaptations to a totally different type of environment. In fact, the only transition more extreme than whales returning to the ocean is when the first tetrapods migrated out of the ocean in the first place. Because this topic is a, an oft-requested lesson in evolutionary studies, I expect that it will likely be shared with some of the folks who don't understand or accept evolution, probably because they've only been told wrong things about it, like that it's supposed to be one kind of thing turning into giving birth to another fundamentally different kind of thing. But none of that is right. That's not how it works at all. So in this video, I'll try to keep it clear and simple and present this in such a way that anyone who wants to will be able to understand it. Evolution is the one and only explanation of biodiversity, summarily defined as varying allele frequencies in reproductive populations over successive generations, where particular traits of some varieties may be artificially or naturally selected. This applies to diversity within a species and to the origin of species, as well as myriad levels of common ancestry, uh, microbes to men, all of it. The same exact processes and mechanisms are ongoing continuously throughout every level. And evolution at every level is a series of incremental, usually subtle, superficial changes being slowly compiled atop successive tiers of fundamental similarities, which are how we identify taxonomic clades or categories, what you may have heard of originally as the old Linnaean ranks of kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. That's how it was for a couple centuries, but it's much more detailed and finely defined now. And we're not talking about individuals either. This is not when Bob the fish decides to grow legs so that he can go take a walk on land. No, we're talking about an accumulation of subtle changes in emerging groups over long periods of time, where in one original tribe, we eventually notice that, that everyone in this quadrant or this cluster now shares a suite of traits that are not held in common with any of the rest of them. So everything the science deniers say about evolution is completely wrong. A better way to understand it is as a matter of population genetics, in which minor mutations occur regularly, uh, and each local collective continues to build up their own unique mutations, growing further and further apart, or becoming increasingly distinct from their ancestors or cousins, such that the crown of every taxonomic clade is the one original form that produces two or more daughter sets that are still the same basic thing as their ancestors were. They didn't become something fundamentally different, just superficially so, enough that you can tell the sister sets apart. Thus, if you have a given population divided into two separate groups isolated by some natural boundary, for example, then after a few centuries or so, if a uh, if you find a lone wanderer in the no man's land between these two separated tribes, you'll probably be able to tell just by looking at it which group it came from. And while mutations are accrued constantly, they tend to be absorbed and negated again by the interbreeding, especially given a large gene pool. The smaller the group in reproductive isolation, the more likely that genetic variants, novel genetic variants, will have a chance to be expressed. Most mutations also tend to be slight, trivial. They don't have any impact on natural selection, but they still lead to myriad forms and colors, a wider variety of whatever that you started with. Uh, detrimental mutations occur too, but they tend to get weeded out very quickly, while beneficial mutations tend to win out, as if, if they aid at all in survival or reproduction. So there's a selective pressure to keep that feature, meaning that over the course of population mechanics over time, there is a higher probability that this trait will be preserved and maybe even enhanced. Then each of these daughter groups go on to produce another two or more subsets, and they continue to diversify indefinitely until you know one lineage goes extinct. And the more diverse they are, the more likely they are that some lineage will survive. And this is how we get biodiversity through descent with inherent modification. So every new taxa that ever evolved was just a modified version of whatever its ancestors were, and they still belong to every parent clade that their forerunners did. And this is how we can eventually get from something that looks like a reptile to something that looks more mammalian. Most of the things on this tree, for example, look like mammals, but they're not quite true or complete mammals yet, all except for the top one, of course. The next thing to realize is that biodiversity can't be exponential all the time. As some of these groups will eventually die out. In fact, every single one of these categories is now extinct. All of them, except for mammals, the true mammals. 
But then when you open that clade or category, we see another branching explosion of biodiversity, which you'd expect because there are a lot of mammals alive today, right? Except that this is the diversity of Mesozoic mammals. These are the mammals that lived alongside the dinosaurs. And not even the recent ones, like T. rex and that, but twice that old, well over 120 million years ago. These were very different than what we have today. You would not confuse any of these with any mammal you've ever seen alive. And again, every one of these categories is now entirely extinct, except for two groups. First, let's look at the monotremes. There are two taxonomic families. Uh, one includes four genera of echidna, accounting for seven surviving species. The other family has only one genus and one species, and that's the platypus, the only one left of their lineage. Even though monotremes are egg layers, they're still mammals because they're warm-blooded, albeit just barely. Their body temperature is lower than that of all other mammals. And they produce milk, but not like we do. They don't have teats, nipples. Instead, they sort of sweat the milk out of pores that the babies have to lap up. That's the defining characteristic of mammals, that they have mammaries, the glands that produce milk, not that they necessarily have to give live birth. Collectively, monotremes are the sole survivors of egg-laying mammals. All these others, every single one on this list, they were all egg-laying mammals, all except for some of the survivors of this one highlighted group, Cladotheria. The definitive characteristic of this group is the, their ears, where some other mammal groups had a hole in the side of their head with a bit of a curve in the cochlear canal. Cladotheres had a complete coil of 270 degrees. Remember that because it'll be important later. And this is a good example of how incremental evolution is. You start with all the traits that defined each of these parent clades, and then you add a new feature, or you lose one, or, or more accurately, some part of it just changes proportion a bit so that it works differently. When we look into Cladotheria, again, we see another branching tree of two daughters becoming four, and then eight, and 16, and so on, excepting for the ones that go extinct before they can branch out anymore. Every descendant group forms its own clade. And again, every one of these listed clades is extinct now, all except for that last one. If we look at Zatharia, a subset of Cladotheria, members of this group are usually born entirely toothless, which is just one line of evidence indicating that by this point in their evolution, they finally had nipples as a focal point of the lactating glands. So now they can suckle the milk instead of having to lap it up. Then, one of the subsets of Zatharia, Tribos finita, shows that by this time, mammals no longer had a cloaca. Reptiles, including birds, defecate, urinate, and procreate all out of the same hole. Uh, so do monotremes, that's why they're called that. But in the more advanced mammals, the anus had become a separate channel from the urethra and vagina. And that's a necessary prerequisite for the next stage or clade, theria, because this is the point at which mammals are exclusively viviparous, giving live birth instead of laying eggs. And geneticists have identified a number of ancestral defects, different ones, that lead to live birth in both of these subgroups. And let's look at those. Now first, check out metatheria. That includes marsupials, along with all these other things. And remember that every one of these, like all of those other categories we saw before, are only known from fossils. All the way at the bottom, we find marsupials, the one category that includes kangaroos and koalas, wombats and possums, and a bunch of other things, including some impressive fossil forms, all in this one category. While everything else, all these other groups of mammals are now entirely extinct. All that we've seen so far should illustrate why paleontologists say that everything we still have, all the species that are alive today, represent only about 1% of everything that has ever lived. That the fossil record reveals way more things have come and gone before us than we still have around with us. And if you look at the other subset, eutheria, often conflated with placental mammals, this one category includes every mammal you've ever heard of, apart from marsupials and monotremes. That's bats, rats, cats, cattle, swine and rhinos, aardvarks, armadillos, manatees, mandrels, and man. Every placental mammal you've ever heard of, all in this one category. But importantly, None of those species yet existed when this category began, when what would be the common ancestor of all these modern mammals lived way back in the time of the dinosaurs. They were already myriad mammals of other varieties that no one has ever seen alive. Although most of them, I got to admit, looked about the same. Now, to begin with, none of them were very big. Better to go unnoticed among the dinosaurs than to try to compete with them, because dinosaurs processed oxygen more efficiently than we mammals do. So pound for pound, they were faster, stronger, and had more endurance than we do, too. So better to stay small and hard to get to. 
And the most primitive form of marsupial looked a bit like an American opossum. And the most primitive form of eutherian mammal looks a bit like a shrew. And they both look a lot like each other, meaning that if you have, you have the streamlined form with the pointy nose at the front and the long tail at the back, um, they look a lot like rats or mice, except that they still have five toes on each foot. And instead of having oversized incisors like a rodent, they have elongated canines like a carnivore. So this is the base, the template form for all modern mammals. And the further back in time you look, the more similar related forms will be. The difference between them is mostly developmental. Placental mammals are, of course, born in placenta. So that separates things that look like shrews from things that are more like possums. And so it continues. Leaving the metatherians behind, like we did with the monotremes, we continue through placental mammals. Genetically, we see that all extant eutherians fall into one of two basic groups. On the one side, we, let's say the southern side, we have Atlanta genata, which divides into two daughter groups, again, the way evolutionary diversity typically does. This time it follows the division of Africa from South America as they move apart in their tectonic plates. Because they used to be joined together, and as they moved apart, this group was divided into two continents with the formation of the Atlantic Ocean coming between them, thus the name Atlanta genata. On the one side of that, we have Afrotherians, the African mammals. That's hyrax, elephants, sirenians, and a number of fascinating fossil forms. Then on the other side, the other side of the Atlantic, we have Xenarthra, the South American mammals, anteaters, sloths, armadillos, and all their oversized ancestors. I should do video phylogenies on both of the groups of Atlanta genata, and I probably will, but at another time. All of them, both sides of this tree, share a mutation such that the testes never descend out of the body like they still do in the other group, Boreoeutheria. There are a couple of exceptions, which we'll see momentarily. So again, the earliest members of either of these groups looked a lot like shrews, being the most primitive form of all eutherian mammals. It's just that one of these had visibly descended scrotum, where the other ones never dropped. Well, I chose to use an elephant shrew to represent the odd one, but I really should mention that, that just because we call it a shrew doesn't mean it's really a shrew. It's just one of many things that looked like shrews. And I use modern species for illustrative purposes, but that doesn't mean that either of these were around 160 million years ago. But this was. And although this is not a shrew, it is a different species than what we have today. It does superficially look like a shrew, doesn't it? The next evolutionary division in this tree is just as subtle as the last one we mentioned. Euarchontogliers are the undifferentiated combination of archontids and gliers, while Laurasiatherians are the mammals of Laurasia which is the supercontinent of Eurasia back when it was still connected to North America, too. These are the Northern Hemisphere mammals. Euarchontogliers come from there, too, but that's our lineage of the family tree, so we give ourselves special consideration. The primary difference between these two northern groups is like comparing common shrews with tree shrews, which are not really shrews either. They're just another order of mammals that look the part, uh, using the same basic form. Every mammalian lineage looked like this, or rather, like this. And... And then even when the dinosaurs were still around, there were more mammals that had to branched off to look like this, or like this, or like this. As we've already seen a few times today, each new category produces an explosion of diversity based on its initial original form, as each subset thereof begins to specialize from there, adapting to different applications and environments. The first subset of Laurasia theria is Eulipatifla, which really are shrews hundreds of different species of them, but they're true shrews this time, not just things that look like shrews. Although there are also things in there that only look like shrews, like solidodons, which are venomous, and moles, which are basically shrews that went underground. There's also different forms of hedgehog, both original and extra prickly, because hedgehog spines are mutated hairs, and that mutation only occurred in one lineage, not the other. The next Laurasiatherian subset was misnamed. It's called Scrotifera because they still have a visibly descended scrotum, unlike the shrews and moles in the sister group, who did the same as Atlanta genata, as if they were swimming in very cold water. When you put Eulipatifla together with Scrotifera and compare them with Atlanta genata, it looked to early scientists like having descended testes was the derived trait, like this is when the New Year's Eve ball finally dropped. But some metatherians have a descended scrotum too, and when people learned the, how to study genetics, it seemed that the mutation preventing this in Eulipatifla was different than the ones that affected the whole of Atlanta genata. Anyway, enough about all that. 
The next subset is Chiroptera. These are the bats, an estimated 1,400 species of them, and no telling how many more that came before that because tiny, delicate things like this rarely fossilize. And there were two main sets of bats, whether microbats or megabats. Again, you start with something that looks like a shrew, a basic insectivore, except that it's uh, one set of them has suddenly has an elastic membrane that became a wing. So now they're flying insectivores. But when you get big enough, eating bugs won't do it anymore, so the larger bats took to eating fruit. And this brings us to ferungulata, which are the feral predators plus the ungulates, mammals with hooves. Now, sort of between these is a taxonomic surprise, meaning that scientists were surprised to see that the pangolin genome puts them here, of all places. And pangolins have claws that are huge and thick, good for digging. And they kept eating insects, specifically ants, because they lost all their teeth and they didn't have much choice. But they had another mutation that gave them these armored scoots. Now, scaly scoots like these already appear on the tails of rats and possums and a few other mammals, but these are extended and exaggerated into armor to protect these harmless mammals from their cousins who have taken to hunting for meat. So setting pangolins aside, we look at the evolution of all these others. Again, we start with something that is superficially shrew-like. Only when the dinosaurs and such were wiped out 66 million years ago, these resourceful mammals who hid in their burrows throughout all of that doomsday stuff going on above emerged from their holes to find an open field of opportunities without much competition or predation because the dinosaurs and pterosaurs and all of that were gone. So the meek inherited the earth and then they diversified. Some of them remained much as they were, developing different taxonomic categories, but they still keep that classic look, at least initially, while others had gotten a bit bigger. And they're not satisfied with just eating bugs anymore. Plus, they, I mean, they already had the fangs and claws and all the necessary equipment to hunt other mammals. These early hunters eventually led to carnivorans like lions, wolves, hyenas, bears, and so on, although the earliest forms of all these were not that advanced. Uh, compare a civet to a cat, for example, and you'll see what I mean. Before carnivorans, there was another fossil group that isn't listed here because Wikipedia's cladograms often forget to include extinct clades. We're looking for creodonts. They were similar to carnivorans, but more like a first draft, prototypes that weren't as efficient. They couldn't run as far nor as fast. And creodonts were like what carnivorans would have been like back in the research and development stage. And they went extinct around 9 million years ago. So we have dedicated predators on one side of Pharyngulata and hooved grazers on the other. Quite a large difference between them, right? Except that there's another missing clade that Wikipedia forgot to mention that should be in the middle between them. These were the mesonychids, meat-eating predators that kept their fangs and developed hooves instead of claws. Hooves are like when uh, a fingernail forms a thick protective covering over the entire tip of the toe. So it's like wearing shoes on rough terrain, which is helpful. But it also meant that they couldn't seize their prey like carnivorans could. And that mix of traits didn't work out so well for them. Mesonychids diversified into several distinct species, but they didn't last long. They apparently went extinct in the early Oligocene around 33 million years ago. So now we get to euungulata, hooved animals, but obviously not all hooved animals. The hooves evolved independently a few times. An illustrative example of that is the modern pig-footed bandicoot. And doesn't it look like a shrew with hooves? It's not a shrew, it's a marsupial. Thus its hooves have no relation to the hooves of pharyngulata. So you have a branching tree of mammals that are now getting larger, and the bigger they get, the more likely they are to have hooves. Or it would be more accurate to say that once they already had hooves, then they would be better adapted for being heavier if they got bigger. Because this didn't just happen with the Laurasiatherian lineage, it also happened with meridiungulates in South America and proboscideans in Africa. This adaptation happened a number of times. There was even a hooved crocodilian alive back then, in that first 10 to 20 million years after the dinosaur's demise. But this group, the clade of hooved mammals, the ungulates, were not strictly hunters. They had a more diverse diet. Now, some of them eventually went vegetarian, but they started out omnivorous. As with most clades, this one too has two daughters. The common ancestor of both groups didn't look much like shrews anymore. Well, they looked like shrews that had gotten bigger and had hooves. And like shrews, they started out pentadactyl with five toes, which is the basic template for all tetrapods, really, not just mammals. But ungulates are classified a bit differently, and the differences between these groups initially seem insignificant. Perissodactyls focus all their weight on their middle toe. 
uh, the wood is often supported by the other two toes around it so that each foot becomes a, a tripod. Uh, the outside toes often don't even touch the ground, so they were lost early on. Now, the thumb went away first, and then the pinky. Remember that the fossil ancestors of horses had four toes on their front feet and three toes on the back, but the fourth finger on that front foot didn't touch the ground, so they function as three-toed ungulates. The later horses had three toes on all four feet, but because they're fleet-footed and fast, then eventually the index and ring finger didn't touch the ground either, so modern horses run on only one toe, and you can barely see the vestige of those other toes left in the bones of their legs. Other perissodactyls stuck with the tripod configuration. This gets us to tapirs and rhinos, which are much more varied in fossil forms than you think. There were other fossil clades, too, that Wikipedia tends to forget about, like calicotheres, essentially horses with three massive claws on each foot. Importantly, we don't need to count the toes. We could discover a new fossil like this, but without the feet, and we would still know it was perissodactyl because of certain unique peculiarities in the rest of the skeleton. They confirm, even without the feet, that you know this is not something we could confuse with a deer or a cow. A trained eye would recognize that brontotherium is more like a really big, really butch horse. And whether it's on three toes or on one, those are odd numbers. So perissodactyls are the odd-toed ungulates. Artiodactyls, on the other hand, rest their weight on these two digits. And again, they usually lost the thumb early on because they don't use it. So they're down to four toes. And some kept the other two toes behind the first one, which creates the cloven hoof seen on pigs and deer and that sort of thing. Where the back toes are smaller, and they may not even be load-bearing. They often don't touch the ground. Some artiodactyls lost those back toes, too. Think camels and llamas. Oh, and those weird-looking things with puddle openers on their faces. Now, these are all tylopods, and tylopods only walk on these two toes. Whether any of these animals have two or four toes, it's an even number. So the artiodactyls are collectively the even-toed ungulates. It is from this taxonomic order of mammals, artiodactyls, the even-toed ungulates, that whales emerged. But not from any of the families that are known today. Whales diverged way early, before any of these other families were yet identifiable by the average person, before they were recognizable as camels or pigs or deer. Another thing to consider is that just because modern artiodactyls are typically herbivorous, it doesn't mean that they always were. They started out omnivorous, and some of them still are. A deer and cattle will eat meat on occasion. Pigs certainly will, too. They will go through a body that weighs 200 pounds in about eight minutes. That means that a single pig can consume two pounds of uncooked flesh every minute. Hence the expression, as greedy as a pig. Now let's look at those things whose point of origin is closest to that of whales. First, let's look at Anoloplotherium. These appear to be close to the base of Artiodactyla, and some of them have three toes, but only two of them touch the ground. Paleontologists have consequently associated these with tylopods, like camels and llamas, but they also admit to basal traits in common with hippos and such, too, because they're at the base of the clade where they're still closely related to the ancestors of all these other groups. For decades, many paleontologists thought that Anoloplotheria might be aquatic, adapted to living in the water. Importantly, though, look how they're starting to take on the look of hooved herbivores rather than shrews. They've even lost their canines, so they're not meat-eaters anymore. These guys are necessarily vegetarian, but they still have that generalized look. Every clade of hooved animals eventually reduced their tails down to little more than fly swatters because they couldn't use their tails for anything else. But they started out looking like this, where they still had long, powerful tails. And from here, we see more specialization, starting with xiphodons and then oromericids, which look like proto-llamas, what may become llamas, and of course camels, because camels are llamas, but bigger and with humps. Now, moving to the right on this chart, we get to familiar things eventually, giraffes, deer, cattle. I really ought to do another video just on those, and I probably will again later on. But closer to the base of this tree, where everything is more generalized, look at the oreodonts. Like the mesonicids, these look like an intermediate form between meat-eating carnivorans and plant-eating herd animals. Getting even closer to the base, we get even more generalized. Dicabunidae are the very earliest artidactyls. They're not just generalized, they're tiny. 
They still have five toes on each foot and they haven't even lost their thumb yet. And they still have long adaptable tails. And they still have a complete set of differentiated teeth. Look at those choppers allowing for an omnivorous diet. Could they eat meat? Looks like it. More specifically, could they eat fish? Now, going to the left side of this tree, we see pigs and peccaries and things that look like pigs, but are much bigger and apparently meaner. This group includes intelodonts, often called hell pigs. And this group also includes what may be the largest terrestrial predatory mammal ever, Andrusarchus, which is like something between a hippo and a pig. It's neither, but a bit of both. And now look at the clade of anthracotheres. And we can see where this lineage is going. They all look like hippos. And now we know that genetically, the closest living relative to whales is the hippopotamus. But that's living relatives. Everything below the hippos in this chart is not alive anymore, but they would have been more closely related to whales than hippos are. Hippos are also responsible for an average of 500 human deaths every year. Sometimes even eat people and other animals too. They will eat meat. They're also aquatic, so we can only assume that the anthracotheres must have lived similarly. But they all have very short tails, don't they? Whales depend on their tails for propulsion, not their legs. If they started out like hippos, then they would have to adapt the legs for swimming, much like seals did, because seals evolved from short-tailed mammals too. So if whales depend on their tails now, then they must have evolved from mammals that already had tails that were long enough and strong enough to swim with, or at least to assist the legs while swimming, uh, like with beaver's tails, for example. I don't know how old this cladogram is, but it looks like it's from at least a couple decades ago, back when they thought that whales might have descended from mesonychids. That's the only explanation for why cetaceans are not listed here. So where would they be listed if they were on this chart? What we're looking for should be right in this gap between the hippo-like aquatic anthracotheres and the long-tailed oreodonts and the basal five-fingered long-tailed dicabunids because we're looking for a five-fingered, long-tailed omnivore. Maybe it's even semi-aquatic, like the hippos, but even if it is, it got that way independently because of the tail. Hippos walk around on the bottom of the rivers and such, and they don't swim. And we're looking for something that swims. Now, this gap is not only where we should look, but also when, in the early Eocene, roughly 50 million years ago. So looking there, what do we find? Endohyus looks very like Diacodexus and the other Dicabunids on the outside, but there are some internal modifications. Its name means pig of India. If it looks like a pig but also like a deer, it might be because the base of their lineage is between both. Although it looks graceful and lightweight, the skeleton is more similar to that of hippos, including the fact that the bones have a thick outer layer, making them heavier and less buoyant, which is good if you want to hide underwater, either you know, to hide from a predator or to hide as a predator an ambush predator, like crocodiles. If your bones are heavy enough that you don't float, then you can walk or stand on the bottom and not expend energy struggling to keep from floating to the surface. Then you can be stealthy, unnoticed, until you lunge at whatever it is you're trying to catch. So despite its appearance, it shares some traits with hippos. And there, there's nothing about this animal that looks aquatic yet. It just looks more like a tiny, long-tailed pig deer. But if it did go in the water, it would do very well. And it seems that they did on occasion. Even if it was primarily herbivorous and rarely ate fish, as is indicated by the amount of carbon-13 in the enamel of their teeth, there are still ratios of oxygen isotopes there too that are more like those of aquatic mammals, like hippos, and, and not like other land animals. There's one more important feature. Remember how cladotheres were the one group of mammals that had a 270 degree curve inside their inner ear, which is what we have, which is what makes us and all of these other placental mammals a subset of cladotheres? Well, building on that, there's another subtle feature on Indohyus, the auditory bulla, which replaces the eardrum when trying to hear underwater. On Indohyus, the edge of the bulla is thickened into an involucrum. The effect of that is that it can hear much better underwater. And this subtle feature is not shared with any other mammal except whales. It wasn't fully developed like it is in whales, but that definitive cetacean feature, along with the evident relationship of anthracoceres to hippos, puts Hippopotamoidea, along with Indohyus and the other species in its immediate family, Rhyalidae, into one unified clade called Whipomorpha. 
Now, switching from this chart, which is based on morphology and includes fossil forms, at least some of them, not all of the ones that should be here, we'll move on to this other chart, which is based on genomic sequence comparisons and therefore only includes living species because we can't get complete DNA for extinct ones. Mind you, this chart was composed by computerized genetic analysis for all these groups. So it is an objective fact, not a product of someone's bias, imagination, or opinion. This subgroup is called set ruminantia, meaning whales and ruminants together. Ruminants being cattle, antelope, deer, giraffes, things that chew the cud. But now we're in this subgroup, whipomorpha, which means whales and hippos. Even though they are genetically similar, they don't look much alike, and neither one looks like Indohias either. So where are the transitional intermediate forms? Let's dive into those now. Indohias and the half dozen other genera in the family Realidae are only considered to be a cousin of whales, a sister group to Cetacea. Indohias fossils were found in Kashmir, just north of Pakistan. But Pakicetus is the whale of Pakistan. Although a lot of fossil whales were found in Pakistan, in an area that used to be a shallow sea called the Tethys Sea. This sea existed until 30 or 40 million years ago when the Indian subcontinent collided with the Eurasian supercontinent. The sea floor between them was pushed skyward as the continental plates collided, forming the Himalayas, which is why you can find marine fossils in the world's tallest mountains. That collision is still going on, by the way, as the Himalayas continue to rise at a rate of almost two and a half inches per year. Pachycetus is the oldest known whale. Its fossils were dated from 50 million to 48 million years old. Yes, the half dozen species of Pachycetids are not just cousins of whales, they are considered whales themselves, and you'll see why as we press on. Like Indohias, Pachycetus had an involucrum, the uniquely diagnostic feature of cetaceans, while it also had an astragalus, which is a type of double pulley ankle bone that is uniquely diagnostic of artiodactyls. So genetic and fossil data corroborate, as they usually do. Pachycetids also had heavier bones for staying submerged in the water, and their toes were splayed out in a way that would have made them much better swimmers than runners. And while Indohias was still eating plants on land, Pachycetus was definitely adapted for eating fish in the water because its teeth had changed into these triangular blades. And look where the eyes are, right at the top of the head. So this thing could hide in the water with only its eyes and nose sticking out, like a crocodile, or a hippo. The further back in time you look, the more similar related things appear to be, because they were more closely related then. Now, similarly, the young of two closely related species will look more alike than the adults do. So let's compare the skull of Pachycetus to the skull of a juvenile pygmy hippo. Don't see the resemblance yet? Well, if the hippo was a swimmer, then it would have to be more streamlined. So let's stretch the skull out a bit. <laughs> now they look related. Now surprisingly similar now, aren't they? But they will grow further apart from here. Ambulocetus lived between 49 and 47 million years ago in the same part of the world as Pachycetus and Endohias. The name Ambulocetus means walking whale. It evidently could walk, though not as well as Pachycetus could, which wasn't as well as Endohias could. Ambulocetus must have been uncomfortable ambling awkwardly on land. Although it wasn't a great swimmer either, it was better off in the water. Although it had little hooves on its toes, it also had webbing between its toes. It could be an ambush predator hiding in the water's edge like a crocodile, but it was more capable out in the open water. The type of oxygen isotopes found in their bones also implied that two of the three known species of Ambulocetus were drinking both salt and fresh water. So they likely spent a lot of time in estuaries, river deltas, and they were becoming seaworthy. Logically, we must assume that Pachycetus undulated its back legs with its tail when swimming. At some point, we should expect that the tail of later species, like Ambulocetus, would broaden out like an otter's tail to provide more power for more efficient swimming, and the caudal vertebrae of Ambulocetus was slightly flattened, as you would expect, if that was the case. By the time we get to Cuchicetus, 46 to 43 million years ago, the legs have shortened so much that they can't do much anymore. They're pretty much just landing gear now. Instead, it relies entirely on its tail to provide all the propulsion. So it must have been broader by then, or you know, like an otter's tail. Cuchicetus, however, belongs to a family of Remingtonocetids, of which there are 10 other known species in a half dozen genera, and the group is fairly diverse, such that this one species doesn't represent them all. 
And they weren't the only ones around then, either. Between 47 million and 41 million years ago, there were at least 15 other species of four-legged proto-whales that could still walk, however ungainly. One of them, Rhodocetus, seems to have relied primarily on its legs for swimming rather than its slightly diminished tail. Another one, Myocetus, was found with an unborn baby inside her, positioned for a head-first delivery. Terrestrial animals typically give birth head-first, but tetrapods that have returned to the sea give birth tail-first to reduce the risk of drowning the baby during birth, allowing them as much time as possible to swim to the surface to take that first breath. So assuming this was the normal birthing position for this species implies that they were still giving birth on land. Yet at the same time, the pelvis was not securely connected to the vertebral column, which means that it's no longer a walking whale. It could undulate the pelvic region and the tail up and down from the water more effectively for swimming, but on land it would have been as handicapped as a seal. The teeth of this first generation of early archaeocetids were still differentiated somewhat, but not so much in the next generation. From 41 million to 38 million years ago, there was a second generation of a, another handful of species of protocetids showing a wider distribution. Up to now, they were only able to swim so far, so they've only been found along the ancient shorelines of the Indian subcontinent, which was an island at that time, drifting northward on its own tectonic plate. The world map looked a bit different then. The Arabian Peninsula was entirely underwater, so that the Mediterranean Sea was just a part of the Tethys Sea. Now, 40 million years ago, the currents made travel from Africa to South America much easier, especially as the two continents were only about half as far apart as they are now. So as these early whales, the Archaeocetids, became seafarers, they began their radiation into other areas. Protocetus and Rhaenistes fossils have been found in Egypt, which was on the other side of the Tethys Sea at that time. Unidentified Archaeocetid fossils have been found in West Africa. Georgiocetus fossils were found in the southern United States. And Paragocetus was found in Peru, so they made it all the way to the Pacific. Interestingly, Paragocetus was still a quadruped, capable of walking around on land. Other contemporary whales like Georgiocetus and Aegeocetus had little or no sacroiliac joint, virtually no connection between the pelvis and vertebrae, so they couldn't walk at all anymore. Yet they crossed an ocean, a small one, but still. Some of the second generation of Archaeocetids had their nostrils, not on the ends of their snouts anymore, but higher up, closer to the eyes. Of course, modern whales have their nostrils all the way up above their eyes, on the tops of their heads. Some of these, like Georgiocetus, apparently used their legs when swimming, while others, like Protocetus, relied entirely on their tails, with indications in their caudal vertebrae hinting at the development of tail flukes, fully empowering the tail. And this is associated with a dramatic reduction in the size and function of the legs, particularly the hind legs, as they can't do much at all anymore. Maybe Protocetus had a rounded fluke like manatees have before they developed the more performance-oriented flukes of the dugong, a shape of optimum efficiency, which is why whales eventually adopted it too. Interestingly, manatees are another group of hooved mammals that return to the sea, but they're not as derived as whales. They still have elbows and fingernails, a last vestige of their hooves embedded in their flippers. Likely these archaeocetids still had that feature by this time too, though of course that doesn't show up in the fossils. Pity that flukes don't show up in fossils so that we can see whether they're there or not and what shape they are. But this reminds me of my favorite fossil ever. A couple hundred years ago, Britons found the articulated bones of huge reptiles with flippers instead of feet, and they imagined that these animals must have lived like alligators. And this is how they were depicted back in Darwin's day. But then they found this fossil and others like it, clearly proving that these were not sluggish things like crocodiles or sea turtles. This is what you'd get if you tried to make a dolphin out of a lizard. Assuming that Protocetus and their ilk had a similar shape as they evidently did, uh, this gets us to a third generation of Archaeocetids, the unambiguously cetacean Basilosaurids which is funny because the first Basilosaurus ever discovered was mistaken for a sea serpent, which is why its name means Lizard King. But it is indeed a mammal with double-rooted mammalian teeth, and it is clearly a whale, not a lizard. Although some of them are quite elongated, more snake-like than any whale before or since. 
They ranged from the diminutive Tutacetus rhianensis at only 8 feet long, all the way up to Bacillosaurus satoides at 56 feet long. And these were probably the biggest predators in the sea at that time. And they evidently ate other whales, too, including the generally smaller genus of Duradon, which is closer to the size of modern killer whales. Now, their fossils were found in all the usual places, Pakistan, Egypt, southern American states, but also as far out in the Pacific as New Zealand. So they mastered the ocean. And there is also a newly discovered species of Bacillosaurid in South America, Perucetus colossus which may be over 65 feet long, and it was absolutely massive. But it's only known from partial vertebrae, so we can't say a lot more about it. These are the last of the archaeocetids, the primitive whales. They are the progenitors of the next generation, the different divisions of modern whales that we still have today. And we'll talk about their evolution in the next episode.